righteous man rules, the people rejoice. The agenda of God prospers. And so we will insist that the righteous man will be in power so that there is security, so that there is safety, so that there is equity, so that there is justice, so that there is national inclusiveness, so that the purposes of God will find expression. And we are not doing this because we are religious bygones. We are not insisting that only Christians should be in power. No, that's not what we are saying. There are two things we are saying necessarily at this time. The first thing we are saying is that the doctrine of equity and the doctrine of national, national inclusiveness necessitates that if a Muslim rules for eight years, a Christian should also come into power so that there is equity and justice. And number two, we are insisting that the man in question should go into power because he has the qualification and the credentials, the antecedents, the track record, and not just track record of performance, but track record of righteous performance. We are persuaded that where the country is now, we don't just want a competent person there, but we want a competent person that is God-fearing with a track record of righteousness. Because the country is largely divided and volatile at this time. And so you don't need somebody who is biased. You don't need somebody who is nepotistic. You don't need somebody who is godless. And you don't need somebody who is greedy over money and over self-aggrandizement and self-preservation to come sit on the most powerful throne in the country to tear it further and to, 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 to deplete our corporate heritage even further. And so it's important that at this time, we make the choice right. We are not even saying it's better than others as it were. They all have their own antecedents. But for the purpose of equity and justice, and for the fact that he has demonstrated righteousness over the years, inclusive of his competence level, which is without doubt, we feel he's the best man to be there. So this is not religious by God. This is something more significant than just fanatism and by God. This is actually a fight and a quest that God's man who has the fear of God and who can advance God's agenda sits on the throne. And this is also an insistence that a man who has demonstrated righteousness in time past that we can trust, who also has the requisite capacity and the competence to sit on the throne so that Nigeria will not plunge into absolute destruction but Nigeria will be saved and restored to her glory. So, this is what we believe, and that's why we do what we do. And you see, for those of you who are visionary, and who understand prophetic operations, you know that in the spirit, there are many prophetic possibilities. For some of you who are visionary, and you pray, I was talking to some of my people some days ago, and I told them, there is a possibility of more than one person to become president. At the end of the day, it is who satisfies the quota and the quorum of spiritual legality that will ascend the throne. There is a demand for sacrifice. There's a demand for wisdom. There's a demand for favor. So many things are being tilted in the spirit realm to give the winner the strategic advantage. You'll be amazed that even people who are not currently on the ticket can become president. For those of you who are prophetic and have understanding, you must have had these visions before now. That is still a possibility. Somebody who is not on the seat can become president. And it could be in the positive or in the negative. If we don't watch in the place of priesthood to insist that there's order and peace, and allow the election and electoral process to tilt into violence and breakdown of law and military dictatorship is brought back to power somebody who is not on the ballot can become president if there is a rerun or there is a need for an interim government and it is done peacefully there's also another possibility that somebody who is not on the ballot will still be president even after may 29 and then among those who are on the ballot, there are still many other possibilities that somebody who is not God's man to become president. But for us to narrow down the chances to get it right, 
a lot is required. And so it's important to fortify the man of God with all of the spiritual credentials. You know, the physical credentials are one side of the equation and the spiritual credentials is another side. You can be the most popular candidate and not win. If the balances in the spirit are not tethered in your favor. The spirit realm is, is a strange realm. And so because God on account of favor has exalted his horn and you seem to be passing the marks as touching physical credentials, we must insist that even spiritually he will not be found wanting. Where there is a need for favor, we fortify him with favor. Where there is a need for wisdom, we fortify him with wisdom. Where there is a need for security and preservation, we fortify him with security and preservation. Where there is a need to move the judgment scale in the spirit, <laughs> through priesthood and sacrifice in the place of prayer, we can make that happen. This is why at this 11th hour, we are praying, and we are not only praying, but we are also educating people to pray and pray correctly. Because like I was sharing with you yesterday, it's not just about prayer, it's about praying effectively. It's one thing to pray, and it's another thing to pray effectively. The Bible teaching us in the book of James, it says you pray and receive not. I think that's James 4, 1. Just check that scripture for me. It says you pray and receive not, because you pray to lavish it on your own want, your own appetite. He said, you pray and have not, because you pray and miss. So it's possible that you pray, but you do not have, because you pray and miss. And so it's not just important to pray, but it's important to pray effectively. This is why at this enabled hour, for those who are connected to us, and I thank the Lord that most of the fathers, and most of the leaders in the body of Christ are crying out, they are teaching their people, and they are heralding them to pray. And so in our own little way, persons who listen to us and who are connected to us, we are not just calling them forth to prayer, we are also teaching them how to pray effectively, so at the eleventh hour, we will get it right, and all our energy, momentum, and the synergy of the spirit will be high, and it will be at the peak to ensure that we do it, that which must be done is done, and so this is why we are doing this teaching, and so for, for, for yesterday, when we began the series on the doctrine of prayer, we looked at the purpose of prayer from the divine side. Because if you don't study this subject from the divine realm, you may reduce prayer to your needs. And trust me, your needs are too small when the scales of eternity are considered and when God's global agenda is considered. Prayer holds more relevance than our immediate need. Hannah was praying and troubling the Lord year in year out for his son. And why did she need a son? Because Penina, who happened to be the second wife of, the, 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 of her husband, would taunt her from time to time since she had no child. And so she would come to Shiloh every year, troubling the Lord for his son. Meanwhile, God was looking for a prophet in that same season. And Hannah did not understand that God's agenda was superior to her immediate need, even if your need is legal. Sometimes national issues and divine issues will be more important on the scales of the spirit. So your needs may have to be put aside. And so Hannah kept praying year in, year out, and never had answers. But the Bible revealed to us that once, just once, that Hannah prayed and said, if you give me this child, I will give him back to you. God answered speedily. And after God answered and got his own, God now blessed her with five other children. To let you know that her need was not the problem. Meeting God's need was the major issue. You see that? And so it's important for us to understand prayer from a superior standpoint. And when we start doing prayer from that realm, God's agenda and the, agenda and, and the, the need of people and the society is more precious to God. And as you begin to do that, you will discover that your own personal agenda will be fulfilled. In fact, every time a man submits to God's agenda, his own needs become a byproduct. That's why Jesus teaching, he says, seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness. And he said, all these things that the Gentiles seek, he said, they shall be added unto you. So your need is supposed to be an addition, a byproduct on account of your dogged pursuit of God's agenda. 
And so in order for us to pray and to pray correctly, last night, we two nights ago, right, we looked at five, seven purposes of prayer. And we said the first purpose of prayer is to exercise your spirit. And I began to tell us that even from the physical standpoint, exercise is very important. At least I mentioned three things exercise do for us. Number one, I said it boosts your immune system and your health status. A man who exercises regularly would hardly have organ failure and organ challenges. In fact, even at old age, he will be healthy because exercise has a way of boosting your organs and your physical structure for higher performance and for longevity. Number two, we said exercise goes to also reshape your body and to bring out beauty. The best form of your morphology, your physical structure, will not be seen except as you begin to engage in exercise. When you find men who don't exercise, usually, the moment they start getting to 40, 45, their stomach begins to plunge and they are deshaped. But when you find people who exercise, there's a way the chest comes up and it has a way of restructuring your physique. So a man who doesn't exercise at 45 or 50 with a man who exercises, if they wear a suit, you may not see the man who doesn't exercise because the suit will look like a badder. The, the, the looseness of the body posture will affect the delicate balance and alignment of the suit. But that, the one who exercises, beauty, there's, there, there's an exuding order of beauty that comes out of him because of the power and the potential that is locked up in exercise. And then number three, we said, exercise in our current world also has the potential of upgrading your financial status. Lionel Messi exercises in football and he makes millions of dollars. So there, there are lots of benefits. And so Paul speaking in 1 Timothy 4, 8, he said bodily exercise has profit. But you see, why Paul was also telling us that bodily exercise sustains capacity to profit, he went further to let us know that that profit compared to spiritual profit is lead to. So he said bodily exercise profits lead to. He said but spiritual exercise, it profits much and he didn't stop there. He said it profits unto all things and he didn't stop there. And he said the profit is not only in this life but also in the life to come. And so we said the first thing you need to understand is that the same way physical exercise has physical profit, so spiritual exercise also sustains spiritual profit. But the thing with spiritual exercise is that it can also superimpose on physical profit. That's why you can start praying in tongues and after a while you start having wisdom, you start having direction, you start having inspiration. And you create an app that begins to generate millions because you were praying in tongues. As you were exercising, your spiritual senses became active and you began to tap into realms of wisdom that now has financial implication. As you start praying and charging your spirit, a point will come, you discover you become strong and God begins to put greater responsibility on your spirit because now you can bear more weight. This is why God does not tell us the same thing. Me and you can meet Jesus and we'll stand before Jesus. The instruction he will give you will be different from the instruction he will give me. He will give you instruction based on what you can carry. And so two people can encounter Jesus. He will give one instruction about his immediate family. And another, he will give him instruction about Africa. Because he has exercised the spirit enough to bear the burdens of Africa. And so your relevance in God's agenda is a function of how well you exercise your spirit. And we say prayer is one of the ways of exercising your spirit because Jude verse 20 said you dearly beloved building up yourself upon your most holy faith praying in the Holy Ghost when a man exercises his spirit he builds himself up and so God can entrust him with greater responsibility and even his spiritual posture and possibilities will begin to change in the positive because spiritual exercise profits unto all things both in the world that is now and in the world that is to come. And so I said the first purpose of prayer is to exercise your spirit. The second purpose of prayer, what did I say it was? For those who were in the class. To access the proceeding word of God. The Bible speaking in John chapter 4 verse 4, it says, man shall not live by bread alone, 
but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. But the unfortunate thing is that when God speaks, it's like frequencies passing through the atmosphere. As we are sitting in this room now, there's television ray passing, but you don't have the antenna to assess it. As we are speaking here, radio waves are passing. So for you to trap it, you must have the right antenna at the right frequency. And so if your destiny is not making profit, and if you are not feeding on the proceeding word of God, which is actually the basis for living an accurate life and an impactful life, it means your radar is dull. You are not accessing at the right frequency. And so when a man begins to pray, there is something prayer does to his spirit. He reprograms his spirit to be able to pick the frequencies of God. That's why when men pray, they have encounters. That's why when men pray, they have visions. Because God is emitting and shooting words into the space of humankind. But very few are Catalambano in it. And if you don't have that word, you can't succeed. It's a man. If you are a man, I don't know. You, if you are an animal, no problem. If you are an angel, no problem. But if you are a man, it's a man shall not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And the way you catch the words that proceed from the mouth of God is to position your atmosphere and your spirit correctly so that you can pick those frequencies. Many times in scripture, you hear that men will tell you, I was in the spirit and the word of the Lord came to me. Ezekiel said, I was in the spirit. The word of the Lord came to me. John said, I was in the spirit. If there is no revelation, if there is no word backing that word, <laughs> give it time, you'll be shocked. Anything you don't enter through the world, because he said all things were created by him, talking about the world, and without him was there was there nothing created that was created, or was there anything made that was made. So anything that does not come from the world does not exist. It's a mirage. This is why your circumstance is not your problem. Your inability to access words is your problem. He said concerning Joseph, he was in the prison. He was permitted to remain there for a lifetime. The only reason that prison will become spiritually illegal for Joseph is that his word came and he stayed there. And so the Bible said in Psalm 107 verse 17, he said he sent a man before them, even Joseph. He said he was locked in fetters and God did nothing. He said, but until the time that his word came, the moment his word came, doors opened. He said the king sent for to lose him and to let him go. And he didn't just release him. He said, become the head of my house. And he said, receive the authority to teach my senators wisdom. He became second in command in Egypt, from prison to prime minister. Why? Words. And so every time we pray, we are laboring to catch words in the spirit. There's a word about your home. There's a word about your business. And most importantly, there's a word about God's program for your nation. And there's a word about your participation in that program. This is why somebody will become a senator, not because he has ambition. This is why somebody will become an apostle, teaching, not because he has ambition, but because the word that came to him gave him his allocation in God's eternal program. The reason you find men confused in life is because they've not caught any word. And so they look for what is fancy and they do it. If God told me my role was politics, <laughs> by now, we would have been somewhere talking some heavy things. But even though I had potential of mobilizing people, my word is not politics. Those days when we were in the university, I went for National Association of Chemical Students of Nigeria's conference in Adoikiti. And they said they wanted to set up the National Esco. Unfortunately, from my campus, only two of us came. And they now said, those who will vote, every campus that is present, if you must vote, you should present five delegates. We looked, only two of us came. All the universities that came, they presented five, five delegates. And the way they do it is, the president is zoned to one region. Then the vice president, they have one each from the six geopolitical zone. So they now zoned to our own that we should produce a vice president. I stood up. I said, I want to be vice president. <laughs> They say, we don't have delegates, we will lose. I say, relax. Somebody stood up from Joss. That is a great Josite. That they are supposed to produce the vice president now. So, no problem. One time came for manifesto. <laughs> I gathered myself. 
<laughs> I began first by quoting Abraham Lincoln. When I quoted, they said, no, this is the vice president. <laughs> I didn't need delegate. I, people, they, they, it was massive. I had the highest vote. My vote was more than the president. Some of my mates who were here, when I was in, on campus, in 200 level, there was need for the, the department. We, you know, Aluta Continua, Victoria Asata. <laughs> we needed to set up uh, the leadership in the, camp, in the department. And then I was still thinking on leading, leading people, because I felt the, the leaders are all smokers, courtists coming to say they are doing unionism and so i wanted to start from the department in 200 level one guy came from 300 level that you'll be suggest that they understand what's happening in the department talk no problem let's go to the pool <laughs> on the day of election i showed up after i spoke he lost his his manifesto he, there was no need to talk again when he came he was tottering they now say people even his mates went to advise him and said you know for the benefit of the department <laughs> so if it was based on charisma i would have been in politics now and if it was based on desire i would have been in the army because i love the military garment when, when you stand you are a gallant one but when the word came he said you are an apostle so your choice had to die and you won't go in the direction of your charisma if you don't have a word you will struggle through life you will be failing and calling on the name of the Lord. You won't know that you are dislocated from destiny. Because your allocation is only in your location. That's why God will always tell people, go here, go there. If Elijah did not go to the brook, the raven would have come and wouldn't meet anybody. Then the raven would have eaten the bread. Because even the raven was in famine. <laughs> the reason the raven gave the bread to Elijah was because it was a commandment. <laughs> are you following so if Elijah went to a place where he creatively wanted to go, he would have been hungry. And so prayer helps us to access right walls in season. Number three, purpose of prayer. What did I mention? For transformation and transfiguration. You can read the Bible and become a theologian. In fact, you can read the Bible and the more you read it, the more proud you become because of head knowledge. And so while you are studying the word of God, it's important for you to appear in light where the word came from. Because the Bible is not a product of scholars. This is the problem people have. Theologians think the Bible is only a scholastic document. Where they use their brain to analyze it. That's why they run into contradictions. For Peter speaking in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, he said, knowing this first, no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. He said, holy men of God speak as they were carried. So men were carried. That's how they all cut that word. And so when you are praying, what happens to you is that you start traveling to where the word is. And this is why most time when you pray, scriptures open to you. Because every verse in the Bible is a gate into a reality. But it will take prayer for that door to open. And if you don't enter that reality over time, you may use the scripture to begin to deceive people. This is why many persons today use scripture to steal from people. Many use scripture today to manipulate people. John speaking, he said, there are some who crept in among us who have turned the grace of God into lasciviousness. So they use the Bible to steal, to satisfy their appetite because they've not met the God of the Bible. But when you start praying, something will happen to you. At least an encounter will take place. And like Isaiah, you may be a national prophet who don't know God until prayer comes. And he said in Isaiah 6 verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, he said, I saw the Lord. And the first thing the prophet said is, Woe unto me, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among people of unclean lips. The question now is, what ministry were you doing? Because the power of a prophet is in, in his tongue. What he hears is what he communicates. And when a prophet speaks, he's supposed to bring righteousness to a nation. If you are a man of unclean lips, and the people you have been ministered to are also unclean people, what have you been doing? Meanwhile, this was somebody making declarations, but he was carried to where light dwells. And light began to redeem him, transform him, and transfigure him. And so in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1 and 2, Paul speaking, he said, For this cause we groan, that we might be clothed with our heavenly tabernacle. He was talking about transfiguration. 
that every time we pray and not just pray but begin to groan he said transfiguration begins to take place and jesus modeled it in john 17 verse 2 he said as he prayed the fashion of his countenance was altered he said his raiment began to blister and so the second purpose of prayer the third purpose of prayer is for transformation and transfiguration so that you become like the god that you speak about the fourth purpose of prayer is for legislation and litigation now when you have migrated now this fourth level now the matter is becoming heavy you know the first level was about you charging your spirit the second level was about you receiving the word of god the third level it's about transfiguration. You are becoming like the God we are talking about. Now that you are entering the fourth level, you are beginning to gain rank. And so now prayer is not just about what is happening to you again. Prayer now is what about, it's about what through you can happen to your environment. And this is where legislation and litigation comes in. And I told us legislation is the act of writing laws. While litigation is the act of enforcing laws. And so when the man begins to grow in prayer, a point comes, even the utterances that he uses in prayer are given to him. And so when such a man begins to talk, his words become spiritual laws over a territory. If he blesses a people, there's nothing you can do to counter it. If you like, come with wickedness, come with bad belly, come with causes. He has written a law. Until that generation passes, you can't stop it. This is how the elders of old bless their children. I bless you with corn and wine. It's a law. Anywhere he goes to, if you like, bring inflation. If you like, bring deflation. He will succeed. Because the one who spoke, spoke from the realm where laws are created. He said, I bless you with corn and wine. When we begin to grow in prayer, a point will come where the burdens of God will overwhelm us. And God will deliberately begin to put utterances in our mouth. And then we begin to write the destiny of nations. We begin to write the destiny of tribes and we begin to shape the heritage of territories. In fact, one of the reasons we are bold today to declare that revival will begin in Nigeria was because a patriarch, an intercessor called Pa Elte, when he looked into the heaven, he spoke. And one of the utterances that came out of him was that Nigeria, a point will come, it will be, she will be known as the most corrupt nation in the world. In fact, people who answer to the green card will be reproached. He said, but from that same nation, he said, the Spirit of God will come forth. A revival will be born and Nigeria will become the, 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 the what do they call it? The headquarter of the move of God. And from that same corrupt nation, possibilities of righteousness will break out. Now, you don't talk like that because you are creative. You talk like that because you have ascended to where scrolls are kept. And so from that level, your prayer is now litigation and legislation. You are reading the laws of God and the oracles of his spirit. If we pray and we come to this level, then we know what prayer is. You see, the kind of teachings and discipleship in the body of Christ today is not helping. One man is just gifted and he gathers people and makes them babes forever. If I have the gift of healing now, all services from January to December is about miracles. And everybody coming, look up to me, and then I'm manifesting healing, manifesting healing. So all they do now, their faith is about receiving. And they will no longer remember that each and every one of them have an agenda that is eternal. If I have the gift of prophecy or word of knowledge, from January to December, service is about calling names, calling phone numbers. All of these giftings are good, but if we don't, prioritize the word of God to raise people and to drill them until they grow in the spirit we will make babes out of the body of Christ because we are gifted when that happens our gift is no longer a blessing it's a curse this is why you have a church that is full of infants because men use their gifts and became gods over others and so they block those people from seeking God and from growing in the things of the spirit in fact the point come where these men become demigods try them and they will crush you. In fact, they will be so bold about it because they become God among, gods among men. They will crush you and you will not amount to anything. If you do anything that hurts their ego, you are finished. And especially in Africa today, human worship 
deification has taken over the state. You can't even say the truth. If somebody is doing something that is wrong, you can never talk about it. If not, you are finished. I'm not advocating for attacking people. I teach honoring fathers, honoring elders. But if issues are wrong, let's attack the issue and let's be objective. No sentiment. But it will take a lot of maturity for us to come to the table. Where Peter, Paul can tell Peter, why have you behaved like a hypocrite? When the Jews were not here, you were eating with the Gentiles. Now that the Jews have come, why have you departed? What gospel are you preaching? Where we can judge the truth without fear or favor, without sentiment and without subjectivity. It will take a lot of maturity to get there. And for that to happen, something must first of all happen to the order of service. Something must happen to the texture of our doctrine. And something must happen to our priorities as portrayed every time we gather to seek the face of God. The body of Christ must grow to a level where men begin to write laws when they pray. It should not be something that church fathers, apostles or prophets do. If you study 2 Chronicles chapter 20, when Israel were to be taken captive by Moab, Ammon and Mount Seir, and they started praying, it was not the national prophet that spoke. The Spirit of the Lord came upon one of the Levites, an ordinary person. In fact, they traced him to the fourth generation. He was the one who wrote the law that brought victory to Israel. You will not need to fight in this battle. He said, for the battle is the Lord's. What are you supposed to do? The king now came to interpret the meaning. He said, gather the singers, let them go first. And what were they doing? The Lord is good and his mercy is endured. Today, even among the pastoring, people are fighting to be pastors in cities. Send somebody to the village, he calls it punishment. And people will bribe in order not to go to villages. And when there is a national crisis, we come up and we are talking. It's beyond quarreling on the altar. This thing requires prophetic insight way ahead of time before election comes. This thing has to do with strategies, formulating strategies that has to do with those in government, those in the economy. These things should be put in place. We are following it up. A four-year plan, a 10-year plan, a 20 years plan should have been crystallized to prophecy. And those who are fathers, because they are fathers, crystallized to prophecy. And those who are fathers, because they are fathers, they sit down and separate this strategy into the different quadrant and into phases. That's the sign that the body of Christ is mature. Sometimes when, we, when, when it comes to the 11th hour and we have to cry, it's actually a sign that something is wrong in our camp. Because even the sons of the bond woman don't operate like that. As I'm talking to you now, through their astrologers who can gaze into the moon and the star, they can do their permutations and tell you what should happen in the next 40 years. And on the strength of that, they have formulated strategy. How they will conquer Nigeria from different geopolitical zones. The economic strategy they will use, the governmental strategy they will use, the educational strategy they will use, all of that have been formulated many years ago. And they are following it face by face and plan by plan. That thing is what affects the way they do employment. Every sector you go to, including the army, every set of the army must have one of the sons of the bond woman as the best graduating student. Why? They are preparing him to become the chief of army staff. So it will be difficult for somebody who is not from them to be part of chief of army staff. And if that happens, the other chiefs, army chiefs, will come from the bond woman. Go to even the private sector today, most of the NGOs, most of the prominent positions in different cadre, every cadre you go to, they have their people leading. They use governmental power to force it. And areas where they don't have governmental power, they use economic power to force it. But as we are here, and now we are building our big cathedrals, there's nothing wrong in building churches. But if we don't have a plan and a strategy to take over the nation, we will keep quarreling on the altar. And if God shows up, it's intervention. In fact, what I want to teach about tonight is prayer of mercy. Because when I went and I was talking to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost told me, what prayer or petition do you want to teach now? <laughs> ah, Jesus said, the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. 
it was a parable. But he knows what he said. Hey, ha. I came with a body this evening. I came with a body. National issues are beyond quarreling on the altar. <laughs> My brother, they are deeper than that. We need prophets who hear God to tell us the plans that the enemy has, how to diffuse it. We need prophets to give us syllabus on the kind of places people should be selected from, who we have enough favor to be accepted. So before the politicians go to the pool, the prophet has told them that in 2027, the light of God is in the south. And so the person you will choose, let him come from there. That's what will inform who is choosing. And so when the politicians go to the pool, the Christian politicians will submit to those from the south. This is what the sons of the bond women do. It's wisdom. And they formulate this strategy. Why did you think when God began to raise our own, they laughed. They say it doesn't have structure. It's not just the corrupt structure in the political system. They know what to do in one night to mobilize millions from the grassroots, one night. And they have these things for decades. It's a network between the bourgeois, the imams, and those in power. It's a triangle. The imam knows what to say on a Friday. If he says it, people will be willing to die. And when the man finish talking, the bourgeois bring the money to sponsor. We are joking. We are joking. We need mercy at this hour. We need so much mercy. We need so much mercy. Those who see know that the, the scales have not yet tilted in our favor in the spirit. That's why we are still praying in the last minute. The scale, it takes a lot of weight in the spirit for a man to, to change the balance. It takes a lot of weight in the spirit. Even the quorum of intercessors that are burdened for Nigeria that can tell God if I perish, I perish, they are not enough. And those type of intercessors are more relevant than 10 churches gathered praying. People who have pure and genuine bodies for the kingdom. But there are no structures. And so when we grow in prayer, we enter legislation and litigation. We write laws. This thing has been in Israel. He said to Moses, teach the children of Israel laws, status, ordinances. They are organized people. In our quadrant, you should know those who have the grace to speak on national matters. And so when issues like this come, if you are a pastor and you don't have that grace, wait. The one who has it, let him download what God is saying. And when he brings it, the technocrats sit down and analyze it. This is the zoning system in this party. This is the zoning system in this party. Because in this party, this will not work. Let's migrate to this one. See, you, did, you know what these people are doing. At the 11th hour, at the 11th hour, they will pull their weight from the man you think is leading now and relocate to another. <laughs> because they've checked in the spirit that the, the, the tides don't favor him. But he has money, he bought it. But since their astrologers have told them, if you want success, this is the direction to go. At the 11th hour, they will have one meeting in one night and migrate. And the, the, the man who thinks he's trying to, to win their favor will stand naked. You wear a butter, but you'll be naked. Is my mind clear? <laughs> it's intelligence. It's intelligence. 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 You will just you you will be surprised. You think everybody is with you. They are not with you. They are reading their direction from a, from the moon. And the moon has told them that this person cannot advance their agenda. And so at the 11th hour, they will move. But we need people who can write laws in the spirit. People who can enforce laws in the spirit. And then when we have such people, our corporate synergy in prayer will support them. The fourth purpose of prayer is legislation and litigation. The fifth purpose of prayer is to build trust through consistency. 
when God sees that you are on the altar, you are on the altar, you know, now that we have elections, there are those who hope that if so so and so person wins, they will be favored. So they will be fasting and praying now. Their prayer will be heard because we need we need incense to fill the virus. Because that's what the angels, the elders use. But you see, those kinds of people, God can't give them authority. Because when the election is over and they, they have what they want, they will go. The job comes, they go. There are those who pray. Those kinds of people, when they pray, God can respond. It is there for now. In case they are casualties so that your people are not affected. You know why? He said there are some ministries that have, they are priesthood as a ministry, not as individual. You know, if you get married now and you give birth to a, to a child or you just get mar got married, your marriage may be one week old, but both of you as individuals may be 30 and 38 years old. If you make the mistake of thinking your marriage is as old as you, you'll be in trouble. Your marriage is infant. You will grow it through understanding, through care, through communication before that marriage matures. That's how ministry works. You may have grown to a measure. When you start a ministry, God will teach you how to grow that ministry. You have given tithe for 10 years, but the ministry have not given tithe for six months. So you have to build that ministry too, to come into maturity. The priesthood of the ministry, the covenant of the ministry, the sacrifice of the ministry, that too we have to grow. And God said, in this volatile season, some ministries may not go on break, but you go. Because you don't have the corporate priesthood level the corporate sacrifice level and the corporate covenant level yet to be able to keep people in a volatile season. It's a trust you earn. God will see that you didn't touch ministry money for seven years. He will now give influence there. You were consistent doing what I told you. See, that's how, that's, that's, that's how what prayer helps you to do. As you start praying, as you start pushing and you become consistent, it will be making you score marks in kingdom structure. In salvation, we are all equal, but in kingdom, we are different. And so, for somebody who is in the academia, as he keeps praying, God will now begin to give him authority, speed, and favor. Somebody who is in the economic world, as he starts praying, God begins to expand his wisdom, his inspiration level. Money begins to come in. He may not even tie to the prayer, but that thing is a trust. That's how it works. It's a trust. And so when people pray, the fifth purpose of prayer is to help you win trust through consistency. The sixth purpose of prayer is for intimacy. You don't know God overnight. You walk with him. He say, Enoch walked with God. God is light. And light is dished out in packets. And so every time you engage God, there's a measure, a dimension of God that is revealed to you. And so when a man is praying consistently, one thing he will notice is that he will begin to grow in intimacy. You begin to grow in the knowledge of God. And the sign that you know is not that you are full of knowledge, it's that you become. And so a point will come when you will start tracing dimensions of God to him. This is different from transformation. This is actually embodying God. A point will come when people want to see what the glory of God looks like. Your life will model it. When they want to see what honor for God looks like, your life will model it. What power looks like, your life will model it. This is why you may find two preachers. One comes up, and people almost want to worship him. He has embodied honor so much that when he shows up, he's like God among men. There are other people who have embodied so much power. If they come to a place, even when they don't pray, things happen. In fact, when they come to your meeting, it's like they are generating power and serving it to you. Things will be happening in your meeting because they sat there. They have embodied that dimension so much that they represent it. So that is what intimacy does for you. Intimacy does not just get you to walk with God and know God. Intimacy makes you embody God. So he said, Enoch walked with God and was not. So when you walk with God over time, they won't see you anymore. They start seeing God. Because Enoch was not before Enoch was carried. He didn't say Enoch walked with God and Enoch was carried. Enoch walked with God and Enoch was not. For God took him. So what happened was he first of all embodied God so much that when they are looking for God, they look for Enoch.
that's what paul said in first corinthians 11 1 he said be a followers of me even as i am the follower of christ you embody god until a point comes when they seek a dimension of god you become the representative of that dimension and these things are in levels a point will come when in your family you are the one who embodies that dimension a point comes when in your local government you are the one who embodies that dimension a point comes when in your state you are the one who embodies that dimension and a point comes in your nation you are the one who embodies that dimension and a point even comes when in the world you are the one who embodies that dimension everybody who is operating in that dimension in god today must route their way through you either they are connected to you directly or they are connected to somebody who is connected to somebody who is connected to you but they cannot operate that dimension and exonerate you from their lives it's not possible that's what intimacy does and one of the ways of building this kind of intimacy is to constantly engage god in prayer and finally i say the seventh purpose of prayer is to allow you to begin to participate not just in god's agenda in time but in god's agenda in eternity that's when they summon you to participate in the league of the immortals a point came paul said i know a man many years ago second corinthians 12 verse 2 he said whether he was in the body or in the spirit i can't tell he said but i know that that man was carried to the third heavens ministry does not begin and end in time a point came john said in revelations 4 1 he said i heard the sound of a trumpet and as i turned a door opened in heaven and they said come up hither he said he's heard the voice of the seven thunder he wanted to write it they said don't this one is not scripture this one is only for those who can be invited here if you cannot be invited you cannot participate because this is for those who have graduated from ministry in time into ministry in eternity he saw a man he wanted to worship him in revelation 19 verse 10 and 11 and the man said do not he said i'm one of your brethren he didn't say i'm an angel i'm one of your brothers me i have graduated into the mortars i've joined and participating participating currently in the current agenda of god that is beyond dispensation i am an eternal servant of god i operate from zion into it that possibility exists and so when you start praying that thing happens that's what happened to jesus on the mount of transfiguration the bible said moses and elias stood with him and they were telling him what he should do and so when jesus prays jesus joins the spirit of just being made perfect experientially it's not just a scripture that is legalistic but it's an experience that you can walk it walking even while you're on earth so jesus interacts with moses and elijah on matters of kingdom advancement and kingdom legislation when these seven things are in place your prayer enterprise will be accurate are we together elohim elohim adonai Elohim. In fact, the moment the disciples were born again, after Jesus resurrected, he said, go tell Peter and the disciples, I'm going to my God, their God, I'm going to my Father and their Father. And so when you start knowing God, which is the umbrella name for him, you first know him as a father, which is the revelation of his love. But when you move from there, you are going to know him as Lord. Because as father, he loves you unconditionally. But as Lord, you are his property. And so you can't abuse his love. Are we together? And then when you move from knowing him as Lord, you will now know him as a judge. As a judge, he is under obligation to himself, his nature and his government, not to undermine the provisions of justice just because he loves you. And so in salvation, God revealed himself to us as father. But at the end of time, in eternity, he will reveal himself to us as judge. That's why the Bible said in Revelation 20 that he saw a white throne from verse 11 to 15. He said the whole world ran to him. Those who are dead and those who are alive. He said those who are in the waters and those who are in hell. He said everybody appeared before him and they were judged. So God will reveal himself as judged. Now as a judge, he will deal with those who didn't accept Christ in condemnation. But those who accepted Christ, he will manifest himself on the mercy seat and judge them not for condemnation but primarily for reward because christ has been condemned on our account and if we are condemned again is the law of double jeopardy that is if we die in christ praise the lord so god at that level will not say i'm your father so take this 
at that level he will judge you based on your service the purity of your heart while serving and the degree to which you are aligned to his law and his purpose there will be no love there only justice will be there only equity will be there and so those who only know god as father they will make it to heaven because of salvation but they will have no reward in eternity because the reward system of eternity is not based on love it's based on justice it's based on equity he said god is not unjust to forget your labor of love and so you need to know god as judge now when you are now dealing with the subject of mercy he brings you to a point where you know god to a degree where he cannot be captioned because james 2 verse 13 told us something he said mercy prevails over judgment and so there is a realm in god we have something about God deeper than his law makes him to relate with you beyond justice and equity. That economy is what is called mercy. Where even though justly speaking, you don't deserve it, but he decides to overrule it through his sovereignty. And so every time the mercy of God is at work, what you see is the sovereignty of God. Because if God were to operate in any dimension, his law will forbid him. And so in mercy, the Bible says God. He said, mercy prevails over judgment. And the only time something can happen against the law and the justice system of God is when the sovereignty of God goes to work. If you notice the ministry of Jesus, many times when Jesus heals people, he tells them, your faith has made you whole. That means Jesus only healed people on the premise of, the, of faith and the anointing of God on his life. But there are many times when people doubted Jesus and God still heals them. That is God's sovereignty at work. But the only thing that allows the sovereignty of God to come to work is his mercy. Every time the mercy of God is at work, you know that the people don't qualify. If judgment were to be considered, every one of them would have been destroyed and so god on account of mercy will release his judgment his justice his, his uh, sovereignty that's what you call in the classical legal system presidential pardon sometimes a criminal is convicted and is waiting to be killed he's on the death row in fact sometimes the day of his death may be tomorrow and then suddenly the president wakes up and goes to the register of criminals and he will pick that name and say this one is pardoned it doesn't matter what he did now the justice they've gone past the level of judgment he is now condemned they call those ones condemned criminal but there is a sovereignty that the presidential office can operate in and you can be pardoned and when you are pardoned you are acquitted that means the plague the guilt and the the limitations you should suffer as an ex-convict is all eroded not because you deserve anything. You are actually gone past death because you are already ready to qualify for death. But without anything, the president comes and says you are pardoned. They will lose you and let you go. This is what we call the mercy of God. When the sovereignty of God goes to work. And so when a people comes to a level where they know they don't merit what they want anymore. Petition, prayer and petition will work when there is a premise. Because you cannot petition unless there's a legal premise. If that premise you present, it says produce your cause. Bring forth your strong reasons. Are you there? Prayer of intercession can only take place when there's a promise. Why petition takes place because of covenant, prophecy, and spiritual legalities. Intercession takes place because of promises. Lord, you say you will do this. Lord, you say we will do this. Because of this that you have said. Because of that that you have said, do this. But where we are now, most of the things we are suffering, we are guilty. We produced it. When church leaders, who should be the gatekeepers, are beginning to smuggle cocaine with long cross as bishops, then you know that the judgment of God is coming. When churches begin to take money from front stars and purge the money for them, you know, there's something they call purging money if you steal money and it's not legal you go and put it in a church account and the church because they can't they don't problem the church will now take a percentage and give you back the other percentage because the money is wired to you the money now has a legal basis 
It's called podgy. Podgy. It's called what? Podgy. When you have pastors beginning to sleep with every member of the choir, and they now sleep with choir members, and even sleep with people's wives, so much so that pastor can no longer talk righteousness. From the standpoint of works, he's now teaching righteousness only as God's nature. Hope you have gone to many places to tell you, it's not about what you did, it's about the nature of God in you. The Bible says it's a lie. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 7 and 10, it says, little children, let no man deceive you. He said, he that doeth righteous is righteous. He said, hearing are the children of God known from the children of the devil. So you can't have God, God's nature and not manifest it. But when you come to a place where they start telling you, it's not about what you have done. If you probe deeply, that pastor have kissed somebody. <laughs> so they preach this kind of gospel so that everybody will be comfortable. There are some places where they even come and tell you, we are all humans. And so even if we fall seven times, seven times we rise again. And God doesn't have that record. And they stop there. Ah, something is wrong. In many places today, pastors, prophets, and apostles send money to settle women. And they come back. And because they have influence and popularity, they use big English and talk. And use the gift of the spirit to cover it. And because people are gullible, yes! The cup of iniquity became full. And so the church lost her authority. The church lost her powers. The church lost her voice. And the reason you will blame the church is because there is nothing that happens in society that does not have its root from the spiritual realm. Yes, politicians are bad, but most of them are also Christians. What did they teach them in church? They will take part of the blame because every man will bear his yoke. However, it would not be as bad if the church truly was righteous. When God took Ezekiel and showed him a vision, he told him the foundation of the problem of society is in the house of God. The people who should speak to power cannot anymore because they've collected money. When a new government comes, sometimes they gather senior people and give them envelopes. You take this, you take this, you take this. It's courtesy. Now, because of this thing you have taken, cooperate with the government. They say, yes, of course. We are here to pray for our leaders. <laughs> now, when things go wrong, are those the people that will come and talk? They gather the institutions and give envelope, extend courtesy. And they become deaf, dumb, and blind. And so when things begin to go wrong, it's either because the anger of God is what is manifesting or is because we gave the devil a chance paul said giving no place to the devil ephesians 4 27 because if you do he will plunder you the devil cometh not but for what to kill to steal and to destroy and so if you know that if god were to respond based on equity justice and judgment we will be the first to be judged because judgment begins in the household of god then the kind of prayer you want to pray is not petition <laughs> if we stand up now and say, Lord, show yourself strong. Arise, O oh Lord. Let your enemies be scattered. You'll be shocked that the first enemies of God are on collar and long crosses. But the agenda of God must what? Move forward. And so the first prayer that we must learn to pray and pray now is the prayer of mercy. He say, all we like sheep have gone astray. And most of us are guilty. Some are guilty because they actively participated in corruption. Others are guilty because they were ignorant. And they didn't do what they should do when they ought to do it. So both your action and inaction can make you guilty. Some are guilty because they kept quiet when they should speak. And so when you find leaders of the body of Christ, fathers that have enjoyed honor, followership and reverence, keep quiet in the day that they should speak they are guilty the man who keeps quiet in the face of adversary or adversity is also as guilty as the one who perpetrate the adversity and so at this time because of the many million innocent people who can't speak for themselves who are just being victimized and because of God's agenda in our generation not to pass us by 
intercession must rise that by all means let there be a window of mercy and so what is the protocol for the prayer of mercy there are three things I wrote down here if I have time I'll add the fourth one the protocol for the prayer of mercy number one begins with repentance you see because it's called mercy it's not just something you go and stand and start shouting have mercy no because if you have not repented him that concealeth his sin shall not obtain mercy if you hide your iniquity if you keep your iniquity you are not a candidate of mercy and so before you call for mercy first of all there must be repentance genuine repentance second chronicles 6 37 to 9 let's read this scripture let me show you how people route the path of mercy and this is not just for now that we are praying for our country it's something you should apply in your private life if you conceal your iniquity or you hold on to your iniquity you can't obtain mercy mercy is not for everybody mercy is for those who begin who repent second chronicles chapter 6 37 to 39 who is on the projected oh. ah, Elohim. Ah, Elohim. Ah, Elohim. Elohim Madonna. Elohim Madonna. Mm. Second Chronicles. It said, but it said, yeah. If they bethink themselves in the land whither they are carried captive and turn and pray unto thee in the land of their captivity, saying, Kai, can you give us a, a scripture that we can read? <laughs> let, we are broadcasting. Let, let, let the word understand. Give me new living translation. Give me new King James Version. I want everybody here me to understand. Give me new King James Version. Okay. It says, yeah. When they come to themselves, this be think. <laughs> when they come to themselves in the land where they were carried captives and repent. Are you seeing this? It's showing you a protocol and make supplication to you in the land of their captivity so they are in captivity god is god is aware but he said before anything happen as they start their supplication they should begin with what repentance and saying we have sinned and we have done wrongly and have committed wickedness go to 38 and when they return to you with all their hearts and with all their soul in the land they are still in their captivity but they are doing they are following the protocol which is repentance they return to you with all their hearts with all their souls in their captivity where they have been carried captives and pray towards their land which you have given to their fathers pray towards their land means looking onto the promise now this is the thought on the protocol where you face what god has spoken the promise the prophecy this is also in the protocol he said but before they get there where they look at their lands and pray he said they what once they must what repent acknowledge their sins and turn to you so the first prayer of mercy is not lord have mercy the first prayer of mercy is to turn away from iniquity and to turn to the lord with all your heart with all your soul the church in particular on behalf of nigeria must repent too many iniquities buried there and people are aware people who matter they are not correcting they are not rebuking rather they are helping to cover and because too much iniquity is covered that's why no matter how we rake on the altar nothing happens we must come to that point where we tell ourselves the truth some of you are money launderers I'm not talking about attacking people calling this person's name calling that person's name no attack the issue when the spirit of god brings witness those who are guilty will repent 
Because if you start calling people's names, you may just create unnecessary chaos and anarchy. And it may become a doctrine of self-righteousness. But the issues we have seen, we can't shy away from it anymore. Money launderers, rape, sleeping with innocent gears, and the cover up that his pastor is man of God. That iniquity, it has the cup of iniquity is full. If we will have the intervention we are looking for from different quarters, there must be mercy. There must be cry of repentance. Second Chronicles 7:14. He said, if my people who are called by my name. So he knows they are his people. He's not denying them. But they will remain in captivity. He said, the only basis for which they will have intervention is when they would humble themselves, pray, and seek my face, and turn, and turn, and turn from their wicked ways. If they don't turn, they cannot be helped. Proverbs 28 verse 13. Whosoever concealeth his transgression will not prosper. But he who confesses and forsakes them shall obtain mercy. Mercy is not for everybody. Mercy is for those who are willing not to conceal their iniquity and their wickedness. Who are willing to forsake it. Those are the people that obtain mercy. And so if the church of God wants God's intervention, men must repent. Leaders must repent on behalf of the body and in different quarters, repentance must take place. And as a sign, that we have repented and forsaken this iniquity, we must speak against it. Today's church no longer talk about repentance, no longer talk about holy living, it no longer addresses sin. We have packaged and polished everything so that the politician who is stealing money from government can sit comfortably in service. And because he's bringing seed that we are using for church projects, everybody will be quiet. And then when time comes for another dispensation, we who have bought those criminals without telling them the truth, we now come and start entreating God to empower them again. It doesn't work like that. The church is blotted, swollen with iniquity. But nobody addresses it. John, John was, Jude was speaking. And they say, we contend earnestly for the faith that was first of all given to us. He said, for some have crept in among us and turned the faith of God unto lasciviousness. I can sit with anybody, I can talk to anybody, but I will never entertain evil. And if I know you are doing it, I tell you to the face. I'm not that kind of person that hears something about you, we talk, I don't address it. And I'll go somewhere and I start talking about you in parables. No, I will tell you to the face. And I've told many persons before and our relationship have ended. Where is the day when there were voices in the body of Christ who cried against sin? Today, we only have voices of miracles. We only have voices of faith, faith that produces breakthrough. We only have voices in the body of Christ today that produces promotion, promotion in business, promotion in government. Where are the ancient voices that cry against iniquity? In the early church, even in Nigeria here, the subject was about character development. It was about purity. It was about holiness. It was about repentance. It was about hatred for sin. It was about a life of no compromise. Those were the things we celebrated. Those were the things we were known for. But today you are a deacon because you are an ambassador. Today you sit in front of the church because you have a position in government. You want to celebrate birthday, you write a letter to the governor to come and attend. A governor that you know is a thief, but you want relevance in society because we are about class in society. Your birthday, the governor came, the senator came, and it doesn't matter if the governor is a thief. Because you want human applause, you want excellence, you want class, so that you are seen and perceived to be at a level. And then we come and we are talking judgment. If God judges, we will be the first to. <laughs> People will fall and die. All these die that we are talking, if God begins to kill, <laughs> You will be shocked, the apostles, the prophets, and the bishops that will start dying. And so when God keeps quiet, it's not solicited mercy that is working. <laughs> Elohim Adonai. Ah, Elohim Adonai. Ah, Elohim Adonai. Ah, Elohim Adonai. 
you know the other day i was talking to the lord and i said lord me personally it will be hard for me to collect money from a thief because before you give me i will find out what to do but just in case because when you are doing ministry your account number is projected during offering anybody can sow the day you tell me this is a thief i will return it if i know him and if i don't huh if we don't guard purity <laughs> if we don't guard purity we will hold our scepters and die with them we will die with them and the nations will ask where is their god that these people are religious people all they do is a charade and will bring reproach to the name of the lord prayer of mercy and i'm teaching you this so you apply it to your life and then you apply it for the nation prayer of mercy begins with repentance you are part of choir of prayer you come you say you are prayer warrior kobo 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 and you are keeping malice you are gossiping people and you are able to comfortably bring that garbage he said if you have a, and your brother has an altar against you and you bring your gift to the altar leave it there you are not a candidate of prayer go back and make peace he didn't say if you have an altar against your brother he said if your brother has an altar against you leave your gift somebody is living in fornication and you know the the thing is discernment become weaker as you become closer to people and you start loving them and sometimes because of god's mercy he doesn't allow it to be known and then you are fornicating you come and sing <laughs> with one tiny voice you think god is looking for narrow voices we must stand against iniquity there's too much iniquity he said come out from among them touch not the unclean thing he said they that bear the vessels of god must depart from iniquity for the standard of the lord standeth sure and so the lord knoweth them that are his god doesn't know people because they are born again he knows them because they keep his standard it's that it's beyond raking on the altar raking for who the same thieves you accommodated in church and pampered for four years now they are going back you are attacking the government oh god what have you said to the one sitting there number two second protocol of accessing the prayer of mercy is thanksgiving because before you expect god to do anything for you you must first of all demonstrate gratitude that's why every time God showed mercy to people, they showed God that the little that they have enjoyed, they are grateful for it. Too many persons are too ungrateful. They are expecting God to do more. They are petitioning God. They are shouting. And the much God is doing, they've not thanked him. You can't obtain mercy. An ingrate cannot find mercy. See, it takes a lot of grace to help an ingrate. That one I discovered it personally. Do you know how an ingrate thinks? When you help him, he goes and weigh you and say, Imagine what this person has and see what he gave me. Meanwhile, he cannot tell how many people he has given half of what you have given him. But he sits down, he's offended. You have 10 million, you just gave me 500,000. Imagine that kind of thing. Now, you who have 500,000 now, how many persons can you give 100,000? They don't think about themselves. Their heart of ingratitude always make them to undermine what they don't earn. That's the heart of an ingrate. And it takes a lot of grace to help ingrates. And I've met many of them. People you labor for, people you assist. When you hear what they say behind you, you just shake your head and say, Thank God, I didn't do it for you. I did it for the name of the Lord. And so if you want to access help, thanksgiving must become your lifestyle. And I've taught you again and again the doctrine of thanksgiving. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 He said, pray without ceasing. However, there is something he added. Go to the next verse. Verse 18. 
in everything give thanks he said for this is the will of god in christ jesus concerning you in everything and so even in that captivity give thanks even in that crisis give thanks even in that pain give thanks if you have not given thanks you have no right to ask that's what many don't know what legitimizes your asking is the gratitude you demonstrated in the first place people are unthankful for the much god has done because they call it little and one thing you will learn as you grow is that you can never outdo god in gratitude because before you thank he's doing more he said out of them shall proceed the voice of thanksgiving and he said that we multiply them they will not be small Jeremiah 13 19 I will increase them they will not be few as you are thanking much it's already happening and so if you want the sovereignty of God to begin to provoke things in your favor your song must be thanksgiving too many persons are troubled without thanking they just come and narrate their problem lament to God and say all kinds of things it doesn't work like that Philippians 4 6 and 7 it says be anxious for nothing in all things in all things including pains it says by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made you can't make requests without thanking it is after thanksgiving that what request is made known so in the protocol of mercy you must thank after you have repented you must show gratitude and sometimes the way you show gratitude is not just to say i thank you lord is to humble yourself and magnify what he has done how did i even deserve where i am is high level pride and arrogance to think you qualify for where you are if you know the forces in your favor that you don't see that keeps you where you are you will know how highly unqualified you are it is pride that makes you feel you are qualified too many forces are at work behind the scenes for you to be where you are and so even when it looks like it's not working thank you because if it shows you the forces why you have not even died that you are alive in the first place to expect something why you have not died you will be shocked how many forces came to pull you down that you didn't have enough intelligence to pray for that you didn't have discernment to see yet god rose up because he has a plan for your life he said i know the thoughts i think towards you he said they are thoughts of good and not of evil to give you a hope and a future so before you ever asked he had a thought before you ever asked he gave you a hope and a future is that future he gave you that you are walking into not because you are smart and creative thanksgiving second protocol of the prayer of mercy i'm showing you sure paths that never fail these things i teach you apply it and you will see how robust the mercy of god will be in your life every day the holy ghost convicts you repent every day don't even see there are areas where right or wrong does not exist it's apology and repentance that exist there one thing one of the fathers taught me early in life he said when you have an issue with an elder just before you start know that right or wrong don't exist because even if you are right and you are being marginalized it becomes a basis for promotion because god will use it to judge humility and pride and if the scale of humility is high he will lift you so when you are dealing with an elder he said there's nothing like right or wrong i'm sorry go if you are right i'm sorry if you are wrong i'm sorry now when you are dealing with god <laughs> there are areas where don't there's no right or wrong i'm guilty forgive me that's how the matter ends that you now begin to argue that you are right that your argument is now what makes you wrong so it would have been better you didn't speak and then when you repent you're full of thanks full of thanks see he said count your blessings count them name them it will surprise you what the lord has done that's what the psalmist taught us they, they they sang those songs for us to teach us how to walk with immortals you say god where are you and you are breathing do you know how breath is sustaining you god where are you and you stood up you are walking he says, as thou know it not how the bones are formed in the womb of her that is with child he says so you do not know the ways of the spirit and so that bones are within you it means spirits are working on your account thanksgiving 
We are unthankful. And the reason we are unthankful is because we are ungrateful and we are proud. Protocols. If you get to this level, mercy would have been coming your way already. And so the body of Christ needs to appreciate God that we have not been destroyed. Because we are coming to God and say, Lord, where are you? Did you see Boko Haram? Did you see this? And it's there, surprise. Huh? What are you? Were you not the one who opened the door? Why are you coming to complain to me? What do you mean? We should be thanking him that we have all not died. Because we legitimized it. People go to collect cows. Christian governors collect cows and give people land. And then they are coming to possess their land. You are fighting. And you come to media to create propaganda. What are you talking? Those days in the east, if you are carrying cows, stay by the roadside. If you want to sleep, sleep in your trailer, finish and go. Now they have mosques everywhere because they come with billions at night. Governors collect those billions, give them lands. They are even, they are even in, in certain eastern quarters now, they are discussing to make emirs. You give them legitimacy and legality. And then you come back on, 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 on media because people on the media are shallow and you are doing propaganda to appear like a saint. You can deceive men, not spirits. Because when you negotiated behind closed doors, they were there. If you like, off the light, they were there and they saw it because their sight is not limited by Bob. Do you think somebody can just throw and come and build a mosque? Far east in Nigeria. When you say your land, say your birthright, you come back, you are talking on media. We should thank God that we have not been overrun. In fact, it's mercy that has kept us. Do you know one of the greatest puzzles that these guys cannot unravel, which still surprises us till date, why they have not been able to, is how to cross the middle belt. Every time they start contemplating, they don't know how to cross the middle belt. They don't know. They look at it as, as a mountain that cannot be crossed. That's why the west and the east are kept. Because when they started it early, that's when Usman Danfodio fell. That's when Queen Amina fell. So they don't know what is there. There's a fear in them and a restraint. They don't know how to override and overrun the middle belt. Now, what is in the middle belt? The middle belt is the poorest part of Nigeria. They are the most shallow when it comes to advancement in technology and they are the poorest when it comes to financial power. Even in government and governance, they are the least advantageous. What are you afraid of? And so you now know that this thing is not about a geopolitical zone. It's about a mystery. He said the hand of God was perpetually against the Philistine. And so the reason we've not been licked up is because a spirit is at work and so when we want to ask for mercy we need to first of all thank him because based on performance rating we've condemned ourselves we've judged ourselves and we've destroyed ourselves because most of the things happening to us as a body today were the product of the negotiations we carried out in the dark so as we repent we also thank god when we thank god then we enter the third protocol which is to look upon his promises because god can't deny himself he's a god of mercy and so the scripture we read from second chronicles 6 37 to 38 he say as they pray they look at the land that he promised their fathers because what we are saying here is just in case we didn't repent well or repent enough and just in case we didn't thank you enough for your promise have mercy for your promise 
Hope you remember when you study Luke 15 from verse 11 to 22. When the prodigal son came to himself, there was something he said. There's no way I will repent that my father will hear me because I don't qualify. He said something. He said, I know my father that in his house, even those who are hired servants are treated better. So he, there was a recourse to the nature of God. And the nature of God is the nature of mercy. And it's on the strength of his mercy that even before covenants were enacted, he promised. Before he entered covenant with Abraham, he already promised. So that if Abraham does not satisfy the requirements of the covenant, he can latch onto mercy on the strength of the promises that God has uttered. And so when people want to access mercy, they must begin to find the tokens of prophecies, promises, and utterances that God made concerning the nation. This is that time when we have to excavate the prophecies over Nigeria. This is that time when we have to excavate the utterances of God over our nation and over our generation. There is something hanging in the spirit that God wants to pour out the spirit upon all flesh. And we are in that last day. How can we be overrun? There are utterances concerning Nigeria and Africa that the last move of God will emanate from here to disciple the nations. What will now happen if the nations were to break? Lord, remember your promises. This is where skill in priesthood comes in. You know, priesthood is not just prayer. When you are enacting priesthood, you need to know how to interact with the presence. If you see the 20 and 4 elders, Every time the throne of God appears, they fall on their faces, they cast their crown. It's called priesthood. You need to know how to interact. Because when the presence of God is coming out, it's emanating, there are different flavors. There is a time when the presence of God comes in judgmental ways. There is a time when the presence of God comes with splendor and majesty. There is a time when the presence of God comes as a consuming fire. If you are a priest, you need to master how to interact and commune with the presence. And then secondly, you need to be gifted in utterance. You don't just pray and talk. There are many ways of talking to a spirit. Did you read the 24 elders? When they fall on their faces, cast their crown, they now say, holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. All things were made by you and they were created for your pleasure. They are telling God that we don't have any meaning in ourselves. We have no value. The reason we are relevant is because we give you pleasure. So help us to pleasure you. We don't have ambitions here. We are here only to satisfy you. It's an intelligence in priesthood. The ability to mingle the word of God and to communicate it according to the programs of God and ordinations for that season. That's what empowers priesthood. You don't just talk. You need to find out what God said for the season that you are in and why God said it. And you need to submit yourself totally to what God said so that on the strength of the relevance of that which God said for that season, even if you don't qualify, God will appear. It's called priesthood. Ah! Hey, yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah. Did you read about Daniel? In Daniel chapter 6, verse 10 and 12, when there was captivity, there was plague, there was oppression, the Bible taught us two things. In chapter 6, when the first attack came, it said Daniel did not just pray. Hope you know they didn't tell us the content of Daniel's prayer. Because at that point, the content of his prayer didn't matter. They say when Daniel prayed, he opened his window and he faced Jerusalem. Lord, even if those of us in Babylon don't qualify, for Jerusalem's sake, for Jerusalem's sake, show mercy. So they brought a bargain that God could not deny. When you show God his promises, show God his agenda and the things he has said, even if you don't qualify, he can't deny himself. Lord, I know I may not have the right utterances, he said, but Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jerusalem cries. The walls of Jerusalem are desolate. The heritage of God is about to be lost. And God could not see Jerusalem because Jerusalem is the mother of us all. And so when you present Jerusalem, it's like the mother, the mother of Israel crying, crying. Oh! The guy had skill in priesthood. You don't just come and begin to declare. No, this is not the time to pray prayer of faith. You need men who are wise. Men who understand the history, the spiritual history of Nigeria. Those are the kind of men that can lead prayers now. 
what did the fathers of the first the first fathers what did they catch in god what did god promise them what was the level of commitment god made to them hope you know when god wanted to to deliver israel he didn't tell them i heard your prayers he said because of my servant that's how you pray now it's a rigid protocol see this is why many don't know how to walk in the gates and the corridors of mercy it takes intelligence when you come before that oracle you must know what to say and sometimes it needs to help you to have the right utterance hey, yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah. Hey. and then when you have done this then you come to the last that's when you call upon the name of the law the bible spoke about Bartimaeus when he heard that Jesus was coming son of David now you need to understand something he called him son of David for a purpose <laughs> called him son of David for a purpose <laughs> because that's part of the promises because the king that is coming is the one that will deliver his people and so when he invoked son of David he was making demand on the promise if you are of the order of David you can't leave us in our plight and captivity have mercy and so when he invoked the promise he now cried aloud have mercy they say shut up hmm. that's not the time to shut up you know some people want to shut us up they say it's not about prayer get your pvc yes we'll get pvc because we know that pvc is what translates the prayer to work and to effect but if we don't pray the pvc will be empty it will be useless and so one can't work without the other and so we must cry as a people as leaders and as individuals lord have mercy upon nigeria have mercy have mercy have mercy because any prayer you raise the accuser may come and counter it and because we now know that we don't qualify all we see is mercy 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 and so it's a protocol it begins from repentance it moves to thanksgiving he now moves to acknowledgement of the promises and the utterances of God that commits his integrity. And then you begin to cry. Nigeria needs to cry. We are at the 11th hour. This is the twilight. The day is about to break. And if we don't make sure in the spirit that verdict is passed in the favor of the righteous, the day might break upon us with a surprise. But that is not God's plan. That is not what will happen. Can we cry to the Lord? this evening we represent a measure maybe a quarter or an iota of the body and so when we cry things happen mercy mercy pregnant women were butchered they were innocent children were massacred they were innocent some of them were born prophets before some of those children were born there were all trances that they were prophets but they were martyred even before they came to the age of accountability we saw mayhem we saw chaos we saw oppression we saw mutilation we saw nepotism we saw sex father show mercy the people of god cannot be left without a witness god said they will not leave us without a witness mercy ah hey yeah hey yeah hey yeah Hey <laughs> Ah, Zaziza Faranato, Aligabanda Rakali, Baragata Zizazala. Hey! Aliyahi 
you are watching online you can lift your voice and cry for mercy because you are a nigerian you have a stake and just in case you are not a nigerian if you are part of the body of christ because the body of christ also has a stake in this country you have a stake lift your voice and cry cry that the nation will be purged that the princes of darkness that have enacted laws over thrones will be disarmed that righteous men will rise again that the purposes of god will find expression and our nation will be reborn lord let judgment be passed in the favor of the righteous you reign, you ancient Zion king, Kadosh, Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. You reign, you reign, you reign, you ancient Zion king, Kadosh. If you need to repent, repent. It will be foolishness for us to stand here and blame the fathers. Even we, there was a responsibility God put on us. And our own case is worse. Because the fathers born national burdens. Some of us, the burdens God gave us were small. But even in those burdens, we failed. So we don't even have the moral justification to blame the fathers for either not keeping quiet or for participating in the evil. When we could not handle the little that God gave us. Can we pray? Ah. Ah. Kai. Yeshu. Ooh. Ooh. Ah. 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 Kai. Yeshu. Ooh. Ah. Ah. have mercy lord yes i did i call upon the name of the lord they shall be saved nigeria becomes have mercy have mercy have mercy have mercy have mercy all we like sheep have gone astray every man has gone his own way but have mercy have mercy have mercy you say let the, the, the priest cry in between the altar and the pouches. You say we should weep and lament. Else the people of the world will ask a question. Where is their God? Have mercy Lord. Have mercy. And in your mercy arise with strength and majesty. In your mercy arise with power and splendor. In your mercy arise with your sovereignty. And insist that your purpose find expression even at this time Kai among thousand my beloved is the most beautiful among thousands among thousands my beloved is the most beautiful amongst thousands amongst thousands Yeshua ah, ah, Yeshua Father, we repent tonight 
from the from the from the the, the 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 biggest of us to the least of us we ask that you have mercy we forsake our evil ways and lord we turn to you in brokenness we ask that you show mercy we ask that you show mercy father we thank you that we have not been licked up we've not been consumed we thank you because you've kept and preserved us and lord most importantly we thank you because you have preserved the remnant for every corrupt generation have seven thousand that have not bowed lord because of the remnant arise 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 because of the remnant arise and lord we latch on to your prophecies the prophecies that you gave to the prophets and the fathers of old father we latch on to the utterances that speaks of preservation that speaks of emancipation that speaks of righteousness that speaks of missionary engagement we latch to those prophecies in this kairos times we ask lord show mercy we call upon you unashamedly for others may trust in chariots and horses but our strength is in the name of the lord our god we have none other to run to for your name alone is our strong power lord if you do not rise if you don't arise for your people, we will be consumed like stubbles before the fire. Show mercy. Show mercy. Show mercy. Mm. Karask. Omela hasilakai. Imuzi biniwe. Anasi hallelujah. Anasi hallelujah. Jehovah omeriwo. Omeriwo. Dimozi biniwe, Anasi Hallelujah, Anasi Hallelujah, Jehovah Omeriwo. Wherever you are, you are following this broadcast. You want to kneel down in your room, you want to lie down, you want to repent on behalf of Nigeria, you want to call upon the name of the Lord and ask Him to show mercy for His promises for the remnant oh lord you want to pray now just go ahead in another few minutes ask god for mercy desperately like one who depends only on god ah Dimozi biniwe, Hanasi Hallelujah, Hanasi Hallelujah, Jehovah Omeriwo. Ah, Dimozi biniwe, Hanasi Hallelujah, Hanasi Hallelujah, Jehovah Omeriwo, Omeriwo. Dimozi biniwe, Anasi Hallelujah, Anasi Hallelujah, Jehovah Omeriwo.